Today, our discussion is part of a Close Looks online initiative that uses artwork and the act of looking to amplify a multitude of voices and lived perspectives. And this academic year, Close Looks focuses on works of art that engage with the construction and reception of racialized and LGBTQIA plus identities. I'd like to introduce our discussion leader, Erin Dickey. Erin is the object-based teaching fellow here at the Ackland this year. And in that role, she teaches a range of university courses from a range of academic disciplines in our virtual, virtual museum this year. Um, she's also a PhD candidate in the Department of Art and Art History and focuses on contemporary art and technology with specific interests in media theory, histories of telecommunication technologies, visuality, surveillance, and archives. So Erin, you wanna take it away? Yeah, thank you so much, Elizabeth, and, and welcome uh, everyone. We're gonna have a, a really, um, I think, important and, and intimate conversation tonight. And I honestly, I can't tell you how delighted I am uh, to be capping off this day by taking a little time to look at and think about art with you. So I'm not sure how you feel, but to me, moments like this uh, seem like such a luxury. So to enjoy a glass of wine and to just look at art uh, and think collectively um, with people to experiment with what can be generated from conversations like this. And especially as we think about the larger goals of the Close Looks Project, which conceptualize artworks as completely uh, crucial fulcrum points for the expression and meaningful grappling with personal identities that intersect the broad spectrum of ethnic, racial, and gender identities. So um, with this program, you're gonna get a taste of how we've been teaching university class sessions at the Ackland, um, usually not with cocktails uh, or wine. Um, we've been urging the students to look closely at art, to sit with it, to describe what they see, and also to listen as their peers describe their own perspectives. So often I will ask seemingly obvious questions like, what do you see? And so I'm gonna ask you those questions too. Uh, and I'm really gonna urge you to resist the temptation to leap immediately to interpretation or um, to ask about any uh, authoritative meaning behind our focus image. Um, but first, just when we turn to the image to just notice. So um, I've opened a bottle of red, which I'm gonna put uh, out of frame so I don't knock it over. Um, and before we turn um, uh, to our focus image, um, uh, I think it's important that we just take a moment to briefly introduce ourselves. You know me, you know Elizabeth. Um, uh, uh, Lindsay, will you introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Lindsay and I work at the Ackland and I am looking for a good conversation today. Great. And Elizabeth, if you unmute yourself. I am Beth Dickey, Erin's mother, and I'm so happy to be able to tune in and see this. Great. And John, will you unmute yourself and introduce yourself? I'm not sure if John may be having some um, technical difficulties. I saw John uh, hop on and off. So hopefully John, you can hear us just jump in um, uh, whenever you're able to. Um, so now that we're all good friends, all old friends, um, Lindsay, will you share our focus image? Can we see it? Can everyone see the image? So first, just, we're gonna take one minute in silence to just sit and look at this photograph. So just sit and look at it for just, just about a minute. All right, so you can keep looking, but first let's collectively take 
a visual inventory, meaning let's collectively describe all the things we see. And as I said, you can leave out interpretations for now. What do you see? And feel free to unmute yourselves and jump in. So I'm struck immediately by the figure in the center and uh, that sort of very bold orangey red dress mm -hmm. um, that they're wearing. And, and I think also just the, the way it's caught in the wind, there's a real sense of movement to the figure and their hair. And, um, but I think that's what in, initially grabs, grabs my attention maybe not even actually because of the dress, but because they're looking back at us. Um, Good, so you're noticing a lot of things here, the central figure, what they're wearing, the way uh, uh, the dress is moving, the gaze, the looking back at us. We're gonna um, uh, come back to the central figure in a moment. Um, what else do people notice about the image? Well, this isn't my first time necessarily looking at it, but each time, it, I do notice something new. And for me this time, I noticed the like wind turbine in the, the background um, near the cloud line that had completely blended in in terms of where they are, where the photo is taken, um, that sort of thing. Yeah, so do people see that? It's uh, on the right of the image, sort of above the horizon line. Good, you see people nodding. Yeah, see so there's a wind turbine. What else do you see? Right now, we're just listing uh, everything you see in the image. The vehicle. Yeah. It looks like too short <laughs> to have engine. So yeah, so you're noticing um, this looks, it's like a small uh, little moto taxi is what they're called. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the small vehicle that um, this person is, is riding in or stepping out of. Good. It's yeah. Three wheels, is that it? Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, two in back, one in the front. Nice. Good. What else? Go ahead. Um, when Lindsay mentioned the the wind turbine, I mean it's a very brushy landscape, but it's sort of sand and gravel on the road. But it's sort of uh, it looks very prickly on the right side, um, and then on the left, it's sort of suggestive of um, like various cacti or. Um, yeah, but the plants are, yeah, they're very sort of brushy and dry and, and prickly seeming. Excellent. So now, so we've, start, we've moved from the figure to um, kind of items, objects in the landscape, the wind turbine, the moto taxi, uh, and now we're moving to the landscape, um, the way the, uh, the, the grasses look, the way the ground feels, getting a sense of the place and the environment. Um, the dryness, what it might feel like uh, to be there. What else do you notice about the landscape? The shadow. Say more about that. It, I was trying to figure out what time of day it might be oh. to have that type shadow. Nice. But I guess her dress. Sorry, what'd you say about it? It's her dress that's got the shadow. Okay, <laughs> okay. So yeah, there's the shadow that, you know, this photograph is not just putting us into a, a certain place, the dryness, the kind of desert type feel, uh, but also a certain time could be, what time would you say this is based on the shadow and the light? I have a clue. <laughs> That's fine, neither do I. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, um, but, but again, there's this sense of um, perhaps it's, it's daylight, since the shadow is kind of long, it could be early evening, late afternoon, something like that. Um, but it's very bright. We get a sense it's very bright. Um, uh, good. So um, now let's think about composition. So we use this term composition. It essentially just means how is this photograph organized? How is it arranged? Um, how do uh, the items in the image uh, and the lines relate to one another. So how would you describe the composition of this photograph? It's slightly off center or the figure is off center. Yeah, say more about that. 
Um, well, the gaze is pretty much actually, I don't know, maybe the gaze gaze is a little more dead on, but the the um, the moto taxi is a, is further to the left than the right. Great. So we're seeing um, this major uh, uh, shape, which is the taxi, more towards the left, but it's still, uh, and the figure um, uh, in the center of the picture is in the center of the picture, and you notice that gaze is, a, is hits the top two thirds and in the center. They're just sort of cross uh, a horizontal line um, that's parallel with horizon line across, uh, uh, horizontally across the image, and then vertically there's the line of that central figure's body. Good. Um, so uh, how would you describe the colors in this image? Right. Okay, <laughs> good. Um, I think that for me, I, I was immediately drawn to the dress and it sort of blends into the red of the, the taxi. Um, and they, I guess, do stand in contrast to this cooler blues and greens for me, but it, it looks hot. I think that that, as far as the colors, there's a brightness, a saturation, like a heat to, to the palette to me. No, I would agree with that. Yeah, there's a heat, the, the saturated colors, the brightness, um, that red, <laughs> the, the, they're slightly different orange reds of the taxi and the dress, but um, they're very similar to one another. So um, I want to return now to the central figure that first drew Elizabeth's eye, the first thing that you noticed. Um, uh, how would you describe this person? Sultry. Mm, so what makes you say that? She just seems like she knows her place. She's mm -hmm. confident. Yeah. She's on her own. What makes her seem confident? The expression in her eyes. Yeah. And how, how would we describe that expression? Sultry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, sultry, confident. But um, Elizabeth and Lindsay, jump in here. How would we describe this expression? I would agree. Um, and building off of sultry, I think there's something about the directness of the gaze that suggests a, a sort of confidence that I would associate with sultry. And then Sorry, my face is in your face. Um, and the, the lips are slightly parted as well. And there's like, a, there's something in the body language too, the sort of leaning forward. Um, you sort of jet your shoulders out. Yeah. Yeah, sort of. And, and with that dress, it's a little, you know, more risky. Yeah. Yeah, definitely the body language, like beyond the gaze and with the foot um, kind of exiting the vehicle makes me seem that like she's focused going in a in a direction forward wherever that may be yeah yeah so going forward again that sense of motion we can see the wind in her hair we can see the if the taxi isn't moving then it, it may have just been moving and, and also the wind that pushes the dress back and um she's moving herself to step out of the the taxi so this person uh pictured here um, it identifies as a musha, uh, and musha is a term used within Zapotec culture. Um, so Zapotec is one of the indigenous peoples of Oaxaca, which is a region uh, in the south southwest of Mexico. And uh, musha, this term, refers to uh, a third gender within Zapotec culture. So um, we, uh, you know, in the West, tend to think of um, uh, gender is binary. That's the historical uh, idea of gender, uh, where there's male and female. But in Zapotec culture and in uh, many indigenous cultures around the world, um, uh, gender is conceived of um, uh, as having perhaps three or more uh, ways of expressing itself in people. So Musha refers to people who are assigned male at birth, but then dress in ways that may be culturally associated with women. 
Um, and uh, Morales uh, also, who's the photographer, also identifies as Musha. And this person who's pictured in the image uh, is a Musha from uh, the same town as Morales uh, in Oaxaca, Union Hidalgo. And she is the queen of the queen Mushas in town. And right now she's wearing her queen dress in this image. Uh, and when I say queen, I'm referring to kind of social status. Um, so the Mushas have an active social scene in Oaxaca um, and participate in contests as part of large elaborate parties, also known as felas, uh, in the Musha social scene. So she, this is the queen Musha um, wearing her queen dress. Um, and as, as you noticed, uh, we see movement from the taxi and also from her. So turning again to this image, knowing how she identifies and also how Morales identifies, what else do you notice about the central figure? I keep thinking she may be a dancer. Oh yeah, what makes you say that? Um, the dress, the style of the dress, it's like flamenco. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell much about the shoes, but maybe they're not dance shoes, but maybe she'll put on dance shoes when she gets where she's going. <laughs> Great. That, it, that kind of reminds me of, you know, at weddings sometimes when people will take off their actual shoes that they've been wearing and either put on flip-flops or dance barefoot because they're they look like fairly ornate sandals mm -hmm. um and they like have some sequencing but yeah but they are they're not quite flip-flops but they are they're flat yeah um, yeah exactly and i i really um i think this this identification of this person as a dancer as some sort of performer is really generative because we're starting now to think about a narrative in association with, in, with this image. We're starting to, there's something about the movement of the taxi and the movement of her that tells us she's just come from somewhere or she's just going somewhere. Um, and in fact, you know, Morales uh, uh, said um, that he likes to create images that present the beginning or the middle or the end of a story that the viewers themselves design. So presenting a fragment of the story that then we, the viewers, attempt to complete. So we've come up with like one possible narrative. Uh, <laughs> she's off to a dance um, for, for the figure in this image. If Morales is aiming to create fragments of stories that viewers themselves complete, we can play along. We can add, we can come up with you know, an idea of where she's coming, where she's going. Um, does anyone else want to pop in with what they think of about uh, something uh, they want to speculate on where she's coming from or where she's going? I'm, I'm struck by how cinematic this feels um, or like fashion shooty sort of. There's something to the drama that I can't quite pinpoint. And I almost feel I don't, I don't know what it is about the composition or the facial expression, but it feels almost like a getaway car mm -hmm. and that she's, that they're sort of caught and, and continuing on. I, I'm more, I'm more curious about the, the back story than, than the forward moving story. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, it's not a, there's like a breathlessness, I think, to the to the use of sultry, and, and it feels like a getaway, um, in in a in a way, um, like don't worry about me, sort of. <laughs> I think. Yeah, no, definitely the getaway was also in my head in the way that like maybe she had you know spent time with someone that day stretched in you know tonight and today again, and then she's coming back or it didn't work out or yeah, something dramatic, definitely. So I, I, I love the way these work together. So, so Lindsay, um, you're, you're noticing that the time of day uh, seems in tension with the elaborate you know, evening or performance costume. Um, so there's a, you know, a kind of sense of, okay, there's a duration to this story. 
Um, and then um, Elizabeth, you noted that you know this this um, figure seems to inhabit a kind of performer's or a dancer's persona. Um, uh, and then there's like a, a kind of a cinema cinematic element to this, where um, uh, uh, where there might be some element of drama or chase involved. She does look like she's moving quickly. Um, and so Morales gave an artist talk last month uh, uh, via Zoom with the Ackland and described his work within the Musha community of Oaxaca as the documentation of his community's dreams and wishes. And he said, fantasy, like the collective creation of a fantasy, functions as a means of self-acceptance and of self-determination. So we maybe skirted around fantasy and imagination a little bit, but this word fantasy, what comes to mind when you hear it? Larger than life. Larger than life, yeah, good. What else? Escape from reality. Escape from reality, yeah. And, and there's something about, I think, desire that, that filtered, like either like an imagined space or a, like a wished for otherworldliness, like a fantastical, I think it can either be like an escape from oneself or from one's reality. Like, I think that it's both like individualized and also realm world world situation that makes sense yeah yeah it kind of and also you know using the materials of one's reality to create alternate realities and alternate forms of existence yeah all of these um so you know thinking again about uh what morales said about fantasy functioning as a means of self-acceptance and self-determination can you see or describe any ways that this image speaks to the idea of fantasy? And if so, describe them. Oh, we lost the image. <laughs> I think there's, I mean, this is very particular to me, but I'm like a bit enamored of Mexico in general. Um, I love, I've not been to Oaxaca, but it is very high on my list of places I would like to go. And there's something about this moment, perhaps in particular, um, where we can't go places. I think that there's something fairly majestic, not only about this scene of like hot desert, you don't know what lies sort of beyond the brush here. Like if it's a precipice, is it a windy road? Like Oaxaca's got like beautiful views. Um, and so that sense of, of travel and adventure, I think particularly appeals to me in this moment of house arrest <laughs> and pandemic. Um, but there's also that that cinematic narrative quality that's like the chase where it feels like I'm it's it doesn't it doesn't feel I'm trying to pinpoint why it doesn't feel voyeuristic mm. but there's something there's something that is very appealing to me about that that landscape and that heat it's raining now and it's kind of gloomy and I've been in my house for you know eight months <laughs> and so I think that 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 idea of travel and bold bright getaway cars there's something that it's very romantic um r little r romantic um in that scene I love that you've used this word romantic because it fits right in with how we've been describing this figure uh, from earlier seeming like a hero a heroine or a hero or an anti-hero or heroine uh, from some sort of, you know, um, uh, adventure or, or escape movie. Uh, and I, I, I think that your point about the, um, the power of the specific place in this image is where it is very well taken. Um, uh, there's 
And when I say specific, I mean, Morales has created a really finely detailed and yet still um, evocative scene. You know, you had that detail of the, the windmill in the background and then this uh, taxi um, that we, we didn't really get too much into detail about it, but there are words on it advertising a butcher shop, carniceria. Um, so there's a specificity and uh, a finely grain, a fine detail um, to even uh, the simplicity of this scene. Um, you know, what else uh, uh, about this image might speak to the idea of fantasy? Not everyone dresses like that all the time. Yeah. I mean, going off of the, the we've been, all been at home, I know my wardrobe has gotten a lot more casual and I don't always you know, necessarily do my hair or wear jewelry. Um, and so, you know, it is kind of, it does look like a little, not out of place, but if I looked out my window, I don't think I would see people uh, wearing ball gowns and fancy necklaces to go anywhere, any time of day. Most people are just in yoga pants and t-shirts, so. <laughs> Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, uh, the the dress, the outfit is um, is uh, like so <laughs> high class and so um, uh, fancy uh, in a certain way. Um, and you know, I mentioned this practice of um, the musha velas, uh, the the parties, the the contests, um, the fact that uh, there was a uh, there's a vibral, vibrant social scene. Um, uh, in Oaxaca for mushas. And yet um, the uh, attitudes uh, and degrees of acceptance towards musha culture uh, vary widely in Oaxaca. Um, in more uh, traditional uh, Zapotec villages, um, uh, the um, uh, musha members of the family tend to be more accepted. And then uh, in larger towns and cities, there's uh, uh, more of um, some discrimination. So there is a way in which, sorry, go ahead, Elizabeth, what were you gonna say? I was talking to myself and I thought I was, I, that's interesting to me because I feel, I feel like if you were to stereotype sort of urban and rural, what we would consider conservative. And I, I think that that, um, those expectations in the, uh, in the United States context differ um, as far as like being in a traditional conservative community, the idea of a third gender being a more accepted mm -hmm. existence. Um, and, I, and I think that, that in the idea that in the cities it would be less accept, I mean, it's, it, it's, an, in, it's an interesting um, distinction. Yeah. It's, or a yeah. distinction of a stereotype. I don't know if it's always true, but yeah. Exactly, it seems counterintuitive, right? Um, but we have to remember that Musha is an indig indigenous cultural concept and it's, it's a, a way of thinking about gender that's very much rooted in Zapotec culture. Um, whereas um, perhaps in, in larger cities and towns, there's more of a, a Catholic uh, and a Western uh, influence in ways of thinking about gender. Um, so, you know, this, this community, the Musha community, uh, uses these parties, uses these balls as a way uh, of creating for themselves a collective type uh, of performance of culture, a collective type of fantasizing about different realities and of making those, those alternate realities uh, present in their lives. And so there's a way in which when Morales is speaking about fantasy, he's asserting its political relevance the power of the collective to tell and hear stories that speak to uh, both collective experiences and individual experiences. Um, what might be some of the possible other byproducts of this collective imagining? And here I'm thinking, you know, a bigger picture. What might be generated from collective imagining like this? What types of ways of thinking? I think that the collective 
part is, um, I mean, in, in some ways it is inherently that, right? Is like, we're building off of one another's ideas about what might, what the scene might be, but also identifying where there are commonalities and also diversions in our own impressions of the scene. Um, like sultry, it does look, you know, and like sort of figuring out where, why, why things feel in common and why things feel where they don't, why they don't. Yeah, yeah. We're returning again to this um, authority and presence projected by that central figure. You're getting to that expression of confidence, of sultriness and gaze. Mm -hmm. It's an electric gaze that really confronts us and it, it forces a connection with us. You know, it's, it has that element of being both um, in tension and connecting with us. Um, did someone want to unmute and say something? It seems that her eyes are almost making eye contact. Yeah, that's a great observation. Absolutely. She is making eye contact with us. She's making eye contact with Morales, the photographer, part of her community, but through Morales and through that surface of the photograph, making eye contact with us. And there's a way that the surface of the photograph allows that connection and allows and also forces that friction. So we can use our powers of collective fantasy generation to project stories onto this person as we were doing a little bit earlier. But her gaze also says, I am me, I have agency, I am in this moment and I exist in all of my particularities. And so I just wanna um, use these few minutes to wrap up. Um, I think that images like this kind of pull us into the particularities of gender and of gender expression and of gender experience, and also into identity experiences that aren't binary and that assert the value and richness of those experiences. Their romance, their heroism, their high fantasy, but also their everydayness um, and their specificity. So there's not just the individual perspective, but also the common experience of creating and telling stories. Um, this is a gaze that locks with our gaze to assert that there is a meaningful relationship there. And just a final thought, um, we might also think about how, and we were talking about this actually a little bit earlier, in a parallel way, we currently live in a world where we're constantly confronting each other via flat, seemingly transparent interfaces. And in a sense, we're constantly perceived as a flat image and we perceive others that we see via the screen also as a flat image. And I, I can't help but look at a photograph like this and be confronted with the responsibility to engage meaningfully with what and who and how we see. Um, are there other thoughts or questions or observations before we, we close? I'd like to know what you see first. What I, what I saw first? Uh-huh. Oh my gosh, that's a great question. Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. I mean, the, I think what probably first stuck out to me was the the general like shape and color. So the like cutting of the horizon line across and then the color, the vibrant color of the, the dress and of the taxi. Just those, you know, initial kind of shapes and colors. Yeah. One thing while we're having this conversation, like the more people added to it, the more I was trying to associate parts of, of the photograph maybe with things I had seen elsewhere, whether it was like movies, like the moto taxi is reminding me of the cars in the Italian job, driving the little cars with the white tops. And then most recently when we were, when you were touching on the fantasy theme, it was like taking me back to the that paparazzi era where they take like the pictures of Paris Hilton and like Britney Spears like emerging from their like Lamborghinis in a very like like controlled you know like hi I'm here the party can get started type thing um so I am dating myself a little but I don't think I anticipated like my brain trying to fit pieces or fragments of what Morales but for for us to look at um, and to make it make sense with the rest of my visual experiences. Yeah, yeah. I think that's such an interesting point, Lindsay, because I also, I've been looking at this image trying 
trying to see if it would matter if she were in like a classic convertible, like a 1950s classic convertible and how that would change. Because her posture or the posture, do they, is it they, them pronouns? Or do you know if it? Um, so Morales referred to the central figure, the queen as she, Morales um, identifies as he. he. Yeah. Cool. So, you know, like if she were, you know, leaning back from like a red convertible, how would that change? And I think that there is a, there's a, a discordance with the formality of her dress and what we might associate with this taxi. I think that, that we hadn't touch, touched on as much, but it is interesting that, that there is something that feels very classic about that sort of movie star pose. I was, you know, I was thinking about like getaway scenes and like to catch a thief or something like that um, where they're traversing these like, you know, windy roads and in these sweet convertibles. But, but it, is, it is interesting how that draws on our visual uh, lexicon in that way. Yeah, um, exactly. And we can also, you know, think about those sorts of images um, of movie stars, of celebrities uh, as both artifacts of our collective imaginings and, and fantasies, uh, and also things that shape our the, the the form of our future fantasies. So, you know, one of the things that you know it seems that Morales is up to here um, is an attempt to reshape how we think about romance and heroism um, uh, and sexiness and sultriness. Yeah. Um, well, we're just at the end of our time. I, this has been such a rich discussion and I'm, I'm so glad um, you could join us. Thank you so much. Um, it's been my pleasure.